In Chapter 6 of The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin wrote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. One of the most commonly cited examples of a complex organ whose origin requires explanation is the eye. Humans and other vertebrates have a complex camera-type eye that is able to form sharp images and adjust to different light levels and distances in focusing its image. However, it would be a mistake to assume that there is such a thing as the eye and that the vertebrate version of eyes represents the eye there are, in fact, many different types of eyes that work on very different optical principles throughout the animal kingdom. Darwin himself noted how this diversity in eye forms could be used to help understand how something as complex as a human eye could evolve gradually through a series of less complex intermediates that were, and indeed are, fully functional. The same general principle applies to any complex organ whose origin we wish to understand, including the complex mantle lures used by unionid muscles to attract their fish hosts. Some of these lures are truly remarkable in their mimicry of fishes complete with eye spots, fins, and markings. However, not all lures exhibit this level of complexity. In fact, there is an entire range in complexity among lures of living species of unionid muscles, just like there is an entire range of eyes which are fully functional but differ in complexity across different animal groups. So, when we wish to understand how a complex feature like the lures of these unionid muscles could evolve gradually through a series of intermediate forms that did not really resemble a fish or did not really resemble a crayfish, we can look to existing species, in some cases members of the same genus as those with complex lures, and see that minor modifications of the mantle tissue could attract host fishes, not just in principle, but in fact in reality. That simple modifications that do not mimic anything, at least to our eyes, can nevertheless be sufficient to provide an advantage to those individuals that have that modification. This provides an opportunity for small changes that increase the attractiveness of the lure to the fish to accumulate over evolutionary time through natural selection, and for the lures to become increasingly effective at attracting fish over generations, such that over time they evolve from a minor modification of the mantle lure into something extremely complex that looks very much like a fish. The videos that you are watching show the lure morphologies of several different species of unionid mussels from North America, all of which are living species. None is the ancestor to any of the others shown. Rather, these all exist, and their lures are all functional in attracting fish hosts. These examples do not represent an actual series of ancestor-descendant relationships or real intermediate stages that have undergone modification from the simplest one shown to the most complex. Rather, they show the kinds of intermediate levels of complexity that could have been found in ancestors of species that now exhibit very complex lures. And it shows that these could have been, and in fact still are in the species we're looking at, functional in attracting fish hosts. In general, the lures that are simple in morphology that do not appear to mimic any particular prey item are attractive to a wide variety of fish hosts. In other words, the species that possess those simple lures tend to be much more general in their usage of fish hosts. On the other hand, the species of mussels that exhibit very complex lures with a high level of mimicry of fish prey items are species who utilize one or at most a very few types of fish hosts. Therefore, this is not an issue of ineffective simple lures and highly effective complex lures, but rather all of these lures are functional, and in fact it may be an advantage in certain situations to possess a simple but generally appealing lure versus a complex one that appeals only to a small number of potential hosts. 
again, these are all living species, and these lures are functional right now in rivers and streams in North America at attracting fish hosts. Of course, all of this is dependent on the fact that these unionid mussels make use of a fish host and therefore need to attract a fish in order to deposit their glochidia larvae into the gills of the fish. The invasive dreisented mussels, the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel, do not make use of a fish host in their life cycle. Rather, they have free-floating veliger larvae, which actually helps in dispersal and is one of the factors that contributes to their extreme success in the environments that they have invaded in North America. In these species, mutations that resulted in slight extensions or other modifications of the mantle tissue that might have been beneficial in an early unionid muscle in attracting a fish host would have little or no effect since there is no fish host to attract in zebra and quagga mussels. Once again, it is important to recognize the extent of biological diversity across species and within species in order to understand how certain features, including complex adaptations like eyes or lures, can evolve. In some cases, simpler antecedents might be difficult to imagine, but in the case of our lures, or in the case of eyes, we do not need to imagine what simpler yet functional versions of those organs might look like because they still exist and they still function in modern species.